which is a letter written by a guy named Paul from prison to the church in Philippi. It was a significant letter because not only was he writing to a family of believers that he loved, but he also was writing with joy in his heart, even in the midst of his difficult circumstances. So for those of us who seem to be going through difficult times and patches of periods in our lives, we can be encouraged by this word from Paul, who even in prison will say, you know what, your life can still be filled with joy. And today I want us to take a look at one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. And the reason for that is because it has one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Not that it's an easy verse, but it is a verse that is encouraging and points us in the right direction toward the way that I think Paul would want us as believers to live our lives. I like it when we have instructions. I like it when there's clear instructions. I don't know about you, when, when, you're, when you're in the midst of something or you're, you have a project or you're playing a game, you like to have the rules defined, you like to know exactly how it's supposed to be laid out, you'd like to know what the instructions are. Paul does a pretty good job here of reminding us of what the instructions are for us as followers of Christ. And if you're not a follower of Christ, you don't know who Jesus is and you're just exploring this, this is fantastic because he has a message for all of us today to say, you know what, we want to figure out what's important in life. We all want to know what's important in life. We all want to answer that question, what is my hope? And then he can say, okay, in light of that, this is what we should do in response. So let's take a look at chapter 3 and see what we can glean from it. We usually go verse by verse. We try and make our way through it. And I want to teach us through it so that we can understand it better. Sometimes when we read the scriptures, it can just, we can read through it quickly and we can't really grasp the, the natural intent of what he was trying to say to the people at that time. And so I just want to do my job as a teacher, a preacher, to help you better maybe understand this and make it a little bit more like Gatorade, easily absorbed, so that we can use it for our benefit. So let's, let's take a look. Starting at chapter uh, 3, verse 1, it says, Further, now further would mean he's already written to them, so we've got two chapters in already. And what has he said? Be joyful in all times. Partner with each other. Pray for one another. Know what's important. To live is Christ. To die is gain. Live your life maturely in light of the gospel. Okay, so he said all of this. In fact, he said this to live not only with belief, to live this life of fearlessness and in faith because you know what you know what you know is true. In the same way that I know what I know what I know is true. That Jesus is my Savior. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. So he keeps pushing this, pushing this idea of joy. And he says it emphatically because he wants people to understand no matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter what you're going through, live a life of joy. Not happiness, circumstantially, but joy. That is not wavering. It never changes because it's rooted in something so secure. Rejoice in the Lord. It's almost, a, it's almost like an emphatic way of saying rejoice because the Lord gives you joy And rejoice in the Lord because when you are present with him, he brings you a natural life of joy. That's what the Holy Spirit reminds us of, just how good the Lord is. So it is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. Do you ever know that you're going through teaching, you're going in school, do you just say, could you please repeat that? Or you'll watch, if you know something about the news or you know something about advertising, you'll hear the same ad over and over and over repetitively, one after another after another. You think that's a mistake, and it's not. It's actually intentional because they want you to grasp this and remember what is being taught. And so Paul has no apologies for repeating himself over and over with the idea of joy and the ideas that he's about to share. I write to you the same thing again, and it's to safeguard you. It's for your safety. I'm bringing you truth today again and again and again because I want you to understand how good this is. There's safety in knowing the truth. And who is he safeguarding them against? He says, watch out for those dogs. Now, I know that this offends all of you pet people because you love your pets, and especially you dog lovers out there who have a great affinity for dogs. But I want to tell you, in the culture of that day, dogs were scavengers. They were wild. They would take and grab anything they could to survive. And so it was they would satisfy their own cravings without any attention to anybody else. They would just do what they wanted to do. And so he says, in the culture, obviously don't look out for the furry friends that you see in in and around your culture. He's saying, watch out for the dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. So who is he referring to? Well, he's referring to specifically although not completely, but specifically he's talking about the Judaizers. And the Judaizers were a religious sect of people, part of the Jewish culture, the Jewish people, who believed that not only 
did you have to follow the Torah, the great works of the law, the writings of the great forefathers of the day in the Jewish culture, but also you had to add to it. It wasn't enough to believe in Christ as your Savior. You had to go beyond, and you would have to do more. You would have to earn more. You would have to be more. And he said that those people are like dogs. They're evildoers, and they're mutilators of the flesh. That idea of being a mutilator of the flesh was specifically talking about circumcision. And I think we're all adults here. We all understand what circumcision is. And circumcision, in that vein, as he's writing this, he actually uses a word. And the word is katatome. And katatome, as opposed to the real word for circumcision, paratome, katatome was the idea of down or off. And when you're thinking about circumcision, he's saying not only is circumcision this paratomy, which that para word means around, like perimeter, you know that word? So around, he's saying not only are we taking care of business around the area of circumcision, they are going a step further and they're mutilating the flesh. They're actually, in a very hypothetical, metaphorical sense, he says they're going down and they're cutting off. They're doing such damage. They're going far beyond what they should be doing right now. They're not helping. They're, they're hindering. They're actually hurting themselves by doing this act of circumcision physically, which he is calling a mutilation of the flesh because they don't understand what it's for. They don't understand what it's for. They think that they're carrying through with the law in such a way that they're satisfying the law. And he's saying you don't understand the true spirit of the law. So when you're asking, you Judaizers, all you people who are asking, those who are Gentiles coming into the Jewish community and saying, I want to follow Christ. I want to, I want to have a Savior. I want to have this life that you are calling us to. He's saying, you are asking them, oh Judaizers, to do something that they should never be doing. Because circumcision, as it's written in the book of Romans, is of the heart. It's a spiritual circumcision. It's not something that you physically do. It's something that you spiritually do. And Paul was saying that these Judaizers were doing this damage by killing the purity of the law when he said that the law is satisfied in Christ. And so he goes on and he says, this is how they are mutilating. This is how they are doing evil. This is why they are dogs. For it is we who are the circumcision. We are the circumcision. Circumcision was an outward expression of allegiance, an identification, a set-apartness of a certain people. And he's saying, no, we are the set-apart. We are the holiness. We are the ones who are righteous. We are set-apart in the way that we act, that we live, that we love, and are in our allegiance to our Savior. So it's not about those physical acts that change us or set us apart. It's about our heart. We who serve God by his spirit. We who boast in Jesus Christ and who put no confidence in the flesh. You can read right over that, but those are three very, very, very important things. And they mirror and model a little bit of what we're going to see later in this chapter right at the end. There are three things that we do to set ourselves apart or to show that we are set apart. Number one, we serve God by his spirit. We started the morning with a song inviting the Holy Spirit to come because we want to be led. We want to be filled with the spirit. We heard it different times this morning about being filled with the Spirit in order that we can do His work. And he's saying that's exactly the way it works. We serve God, not in our own strength. We don't preach out of our own strength. We don't serve out of our own strength. We don't love out of our own strength. We do it out of the Spirit leading us. And so we invite the Holy Spirit to come. We, secondly, boast in Christ Jesus. We don't boast in ourselves. We don't boast in anything of this earth. We boast in Jesus. All of the things that are accomplished are in Jesus. All of the great things and goodness in us, we have to give allegiance and praise to Jesus for. If you see something good in me, it's because of what he's done in me. And then thirdly, we are those who put no confidence in the flesh, specifically for salvation. Because again, these mutilators of the flesh, these evildoers were trying to teach that there's something more that you had to do in order to receive this salvation that was offered. Though I myself, Paul writes, have reasons for such confidence. So again, those three things. Ask yourself this, if you're a believer in Christ, are you serving the leading of the Holy Spirit as you serve Christ? Are you 
boasting in all things, not in your own strength or your abilities, but in Jesus Christ? Are you confident that faith in Christ is sufficient and that it's not by your works, as it says in Ephesians 2, right? Not by works so that any man can boast. We put all of our boasting in Christ because it's what he has done through his grace in our lives. Paul writes, yeah, I, I actually could be pretty confident. that I could boast, actually. According to old standards in my life, I could boast. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. He's not saying this to, to pump himself up or to become haughty. He's just stating facts. He's saying the way it was before, the ledger before read this way. If you wanted to put someone on a pedestal in the Jewish culture, here's the way it was. You were circumcised on the eighth day. That was just the law, and he was. He was of the people of Israel. He was. Not only was he of the people of Israel, he knew which tribe he was from, the tribe of Benjamin. And it says he was a Hebrew of Hebrew. He was raised in a, in a Hebrew culture, and he spoke probably the Hebrew language. I mean, he was a Jew. In regard to the law, which was important to the Jewish people, a Pharisee. Now, a Pharisee is someone who is an expert in the law. As for zeal, persecuting the church, he had so much attention to the law, and he was so defensive of the law, that he even persecuted those who were against what he believed as a Jew. And as for righteousness, based on the law, I was faultless. He was even saying, I carried the law out to the letter. If anyone could boast, it's me. If anyone... Thankfully, it doesn't stop there. Thankfully, it's not, not the letter about Paul, and Paul is getting all the glory. But he quickly turns things with the word that is next. The next word is but. But I had all these acclaims in the Jewish settings. I had all these acclaims as a leader, all these claims as a Jew. I had every right given to me from the standards that I understood as a Jew. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss. Whatever I thought before was a win, it's now a loss. The way I saw the world before, it's been flipped upside down. And that's what happens when you become a follower of Christ. It just, that's what happens. You just see the world differently. What you used to value, you may not value in the same way. It's not that everything loses value. It just loses value in the way that maybe you gave it credit before. So your family is still valuable. Your work is still valuable. The things that you consume or enjoy are still valuable. The money in your wallet is still valuable. I'm not trying to take this away. But I'm just saying they have a different value. And compared to the surpassing knowledge of knowing Christ, as we're going to read, they have virtually no value. Let's read on. I consider everything a loss because of, and because of is saying that there's something better. Because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. Jesus, my Lord. Now, we gave some testimonies this morning, but when you can share your testimony about what you know, not only about the Lord, because that is in your own strength, what you know about the Lord, you can read. Anyone can read this. Anyone can come back with facts. I can come back with facts this morning. I can have no power this morning because I can just read you what this is. But I believe that the Spirit is working here this morning. I believe he's working through this word. And I want you to understand that this has power and allows us to know Christ in a new way. When you know Christ, and I bet there are people all around the room who are asked to raise of hands if you could testify to knowing Christ. You see the world differently because you know Christ in a new way. He has changed your life. Has Jesus changed my life? If you can answer that, you know Christ in a way that you didn't before. And as you know him more and more, you understand just how much more valuable he is, how much worth, more worthy of praise that he is. As I get older, I understand more of him than I did. It's not that my praises were any less valuable when I was younger. It just means now as I get older, I realize what more and more value there is to knowing Christ and how the things that I value before have decreased in their importance. And Paul knows this. He's in jail. He has a very firm understanding of what is important and what is not. The surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. What did he lose? He lost the freedom of the Jewish temple life. He had all of the privileges because he was on top of the world. He had everything at his disposal. 
There was no one that could speak against him. There was no one that could say, well, you're good, but I'm better. Paul had it all. And yet he walked away from that privilege. He walked away from everything that he thought was valuable. And now from a prison in Rome, he can now say that what I have now is even more important, more valuable than what I had then. Some of us live very comfortable lives. And it's very easy for us to say what I have is enough. What I have is valuable. I am so content with my life. And yet when you start knowing Christ more and more and more, the value of those things, I will tell you, and that should be our testimony, those things go down and down and down in their value. He goes on and he says, For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them, the word very gently here in my Bible translation says garbage. I want to tell you that's not the word that he used. In fact, in some translations, they're really, they're really nice and they say dung. But I want to convey to you, not verbally, the, the strength of the word that he used in that culture would be the strongest word I could possibly use to describe dung. Okay? And he used it because he wanted to show that is how the comparison goes. The comparison of everything that's been filtered through my body and my body has rendered useless. That is what we're saying my life valuable things were before. But now, to the other extreme, excessively, the value of knowing Christ. I mean, so if you ever wonder, is there a value in me sharing my faith with someone else? I want to tell you there are people, even in this room, even in our culture, even in the world, who say that what Paul now identifies as dung, there are people that are valuing dung with great value. And it's going to be of great value to them for you to help them understand the difference, that there is something more and more valuable. And it comes through the way you speak, the way you live, the way you love, the way you interact with your neighbors, with your friends, with your family, with people that you don't know. Because they, they deserve to know this good news. This is good news, that there's something better than dung. We put value on things. So he's saying, in this world, the ledger is such that for whatever reason, we are so blinded that we value dung. And he says, I want people to know from my own life just how valuable Christ is. I consider them garbage. The garbage that burned outside of the city walls and it was putrid and people knew that that's where the refuse went. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. That's the calling on Paul's life and it's the calling on our lives to gain Christ that's, that's the exchange that I get to, to, to toss away or to consider something so much more valuable. I get to gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. So my belief in Christ not only allows me to know him more and more, and that word know is an intimate word, right? It's the word to know as you would know in a marital relationship your spouse. It's an intimate relationship of knowing. And so I want to know Christ, but I also want to live that righteous life that he has allowed me to live by faith. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. And so here we go, my favorite verse in the scriptures, at least as of today. It's not easy, but it's good. And it's verse 10. I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. Christ. This is Paul's prayer. This is my prayer. I know that Paul understood him better than I did. He met him face to face. And yet, my longing is to, in my weak human form, in my limited human capacity, I want to know Christ more and more by his spirit every day. I want to know Christ, but it doesn't stop there. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I not only want to know him, know about him, be in relationship with him, but I want to experience him, and I want to experience his power in the world, the same power 
that raised him from the dead. I want to see that physically. I want to experience that spiritually. I want to know that power. I want to know that he is now working in the world. And we hear that as we testify. God is at work as he heals lives, as he changes lives, as we testify to the joy that should be, seems to be a miracle in itself. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection. And this is the hard part of the verse, participation in his sufferings. I make it my verse because I go, you know what? Sometimes you need to be forced into some things. And participation in his sufferings. You know from Scripture that it talked about us being, being pointed in the direction of our suffering. If I take you back in Luke chapter 9, we remember where it says, what good is it to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit your own soul? He also says this idea of whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. So it's not only knowing him, experiencing his power, but living it out every day, doing the very same things he did, serving my world in the same ways that he did, and knowing that as a result of serving, there will be suffering. The suffering may be my time. The suffering may be expense. My suffering may be physical. My suffering may be emotional. My suffering may be verbal. And someone just doesn't agree with what I'm doing. And yet I suffer for the sake of Christ. Because it's worth it. And there's joy in the midst of it. So I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to participate in his sufferings. And I want to become like him in his death. I want to... I want, to, I want to give everything for him. I want to lay down my life for him. That's what it means to follow Christ. I want to know him, his power, participate in his sufferings and become like him. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead, which means I'm not sure if I'm going to be martyred. I'm not sure if I'm going to die a natural death. I have no idea. But somehow I want to raise to that same place where Jesus is because my desire and pursuit is to be with him. Now and forever. I want to know him. I want to be with him. I want to serve him and love him. And so in verse 12, it says, not that I have already obtained all this. I haven't, if a guy like Paul can say he hasn't attained all this, it means that we all probably have some work to do. All right? We haven't reached the status of Paul. No offense, but probably not. And so, not that I have already obtained all this, and not that any of us have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at our goal, or he would say my goal, but he says this, but I press on. I remember a sermon a long time ago, and we were here at the market, and I just remember this phrase over and over and over again. We would share it. Press in and press on. Press in and press on. Even when it's difficult, press in and press on. And that's what a, that's what a runner does when they're running a race and they're getting tired. They press in. They press into the deepest parts and know and remember what is right and what is true. They need to be encouraged, just like Paul encouraged at the beginning of this chapter. I will encourage you, and you just listen to your coach's voice. You listen to your spirit, and you say, you know what? Even though it hurts right now, I know it's worth it, and I'm going to reach that goal. That's what a good athlete does. I press in, and I take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Do I understand that this is my calling? This is what I'm made for. I am made to follow him. I'm made to know him. I'm made to pursue him. I'm made to be more like him. And so, brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, I forget what's behind. I don't put any weight on what's behind. I don't carry the weight of what's behind. And many of you, that's what you do. You try and run the race with a shackle on your leg or a backpack filled with weight from all the past experiences that, are hurt, that have hurt you or have weighed you down, that person that hurts you so badly that you're thinking, how can I ever recover from that? That physical ailment that you feel like is still part of you, and you say, you know what, i I forget what's behind. No matter what I was when I was a teenager, when I was a young adult, even a few years ago or even last week, forget about what I did. Whether anyone knows about it or not, I know about it and it weighs me down. He says, forget what's behind. Forget it. Because that's not part of helping you get forward in the race. Forget what is behind. Not, not that you don't learn from your past. Not that you don't take something and glean from your past, but you don't live there anymore. He's saying, you live in this direction. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward for what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Can I tell you what the prize is today? The prize is Jesus. 
The prize is Jesus. And when we can value Christ in the way that he is trying to describe here so emphatically, Christ is the most valuable prize that you can ever acquire in your life. And so right now you are living in this You're living in this state of relationship with him where you know him, you know him from an earthly perspective, you know him, but every step you take farther and farther in your life, closer and closer to him, becoming more and more like him, experiencing his knowledge, experiencing his power, experiencing his suffering, becoming like him even into death, you are becoming more and more like him. You get to know him more and you are falling more and more in love with him every single day. That's what he's saying. I just want to, I want to follow that pursuit. I want to press on toward the goal. I don't want to be distracted by what's over here. I don't want to be distracted by what's over here. And it says, don't look at behind. You know, a, a, good, ra- a good race is one in which the racer doesn't look back, right? If you're a good runner, I don't know. I'm not, a, I was never a track star. I know I might look like one, but I'm not, okay? I was never a track star. And I, I but one thing I think I know is that when I'm running the race, this doesn't help, Try to see and focus on what's behind. It says focus on what's ahead. Focus on that prize. Focus on Jesus all the way through the race. And guess what? I bet you are going to come out quite okay. All of us then who are mature. I would like to think that that's all. We, we all want to say we're mature. I know that a lot of us are. I, I have my immature moments. But the fact is that our as we pursue Christ, that is a maturity because that word maturity points us toward perfection. All of them who are pursuing perfection, the prize, should then take view of such things. And if at some point you think differently, that too God will make clear. He's basically <laughs> he's saying, you know what, if you don't catch up with it yet and you allow God to speak to your heart, you'll finally get it at some point. I'm not sure if it's when you're 10, when you're 20, 50, or 90, but God's going to allow you to hear this that God has a prize for you and it's desirous and you will follow it with maturity. Only let, up, let us live up to what we have already attained, which is pointing back to what we heard in the first chapter when it said maturely live in a way that would honor the gospel. So join together in, my, in following my examples. Again, he's not bragging, but he's saying, I'm the leader here of this. I get this. I'm leading you. You're watching me. You are watching me. And as he's repeating these things, he's already given Jesus as the example. He's already given Timothy as an example of a servant leader. He's already given the example of Epaphroditus as a servant leader, who not only sacrificed to come and serve Paul, but almost lost his life in serving Paul. Like, he's saying, these guys are great, but now, if that didn't work for you, and you're just focused on me because you're just, your tunnel vision, then, okay, if you want to focus on me for a minute, follow me. Join together in following my examples, brothers and sisters, and just as you Have us as a model keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Not the evildoers, not the dogs, not the mutilators of the flesh. Us. Because we get it. For as often as we told you before and now tell you again, even with tears. Have you ever told someone you were so passionate about something, you were starting to cry? That's how passionate you were about it. If you could just understand what what I want you to hear right now. This is so important to me, and I wish, I wish, I wish you could understand it. This is Paul. He's with tears in prison for the people he can't even see, but he loves so deeply. I love you so much. I just want you to grasp onto this, and so it is I want you to grasp onto this too. That would it be your favorite verse today? I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to share in his sufferings. He's becoming like him in his death. Because the enemies of the cross would say this, their destiny is their destruction. What they are pursuing is going to lead to destruction. It doesn't lead to the prize. Their God is their stomach. So these are the three points that match up with what we talked about earlier. Their God is their stomach. What does that mean? It means they're all about their own desire. And many of us selfishly, let's be honest, guilt, greed in our heart would say that there are things in this world that we pursue because of our own stomach. We're like the dogs who just like to go and pursue and scavenger anything that makes us satisfied. He said, the people there, their God is their stomach. Their glory is their shame. They boast not about Christ. They boast about themselves. And their mind is on earthly things. Did you know it says, the next verse says, but our citizenship is where? In heaven. For some of us, we don't have a real understanding or grasp of heaven. We think, oh, it's pretty good here, actually. I live on a good street, great, great neighbors. I get three meals a day. I you know, I, I have actually a lot of things here I actually really enjoy. I was on a really great vacation this summer, and boy, I wish I can I could experience that again. There's some things that just I, I get to enjoy on a regular basis. 
and I really like it here. But that's the draw, right? It's not to take value away from certain things in this world, but it's saying that, no, no, our prize is heavenward. Our goal is heavenward. Christ is heavenward. And one day in this pursuit, as we become more and more like him, and we become more and more understanding of him, there will be a day when one day we will be with him. That's heaven. Heaven's a day when we will be in his presence. And so right now, it's like, you know, that, that thin veil, hopefully. It gets thinner and thinner every day as we get to know him more and experience him more. We're coming closer and closer to the day when that veil will be, and we get entered into his presence. And there will be a day of judgment. Let's just be honest. And that day of judgment... For those of you who have accepted Christ and you know you are right with him, and there, there are words in this, and I won't go into the study of it this morning, that would assure you of your salvation. They just Your faith in him will assure you of your salvation. This strong language here in the Greek. But he says, I, I want you to know today, though, that your pursuit is important. And someday there will be, there will be rewards in heaven. I, I don't understand it. I don't feel like I deserve very many of those. I feel Paul... Go to the head of the class, and you get your prizes and your rewards. But that's true. What we do is important here. And I don't want you to ever think that, oh, I am just, I've received the gift, and now I, I can sit idle until I'm done. That's not the, the life that he's called us to. And that's certainly not the life that pu- puts tears in Paul's eyes. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be taken and become like his glorious body. I I guess today, I just want us to see the infinite worth of knowing Christ. I want us to think, what could it be this week that I could pursue that would make us more knowledgeable of him and more like him? Would it be that I could become transformed in this process of sanctification that I might understand that I'm decisively and securely and permanently held fast by the truth that he has made me his own and I have an assurance of salvation through faith in Christ and nothing else. I press on. I press on toward the knowledge of Christ. I press on to become more like Christ. And I press on so that this kingdom that He desires, remember the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, that I can be part of that kingdom expansion here on earth. That is only happening when we invite people into the kingdom. Help them experience his presence, even could it be through our lives of knowing him and becoming more like him every single day. That's the way people experience the kingdom. It's not this far-off, unattainable goal. It starts with you, and it starts with me. Praying that prayer in Philippians 3, verse 10. I want to know Christ. Do you want to know Christ? Do you want to know his power? Do you want to share in his sufferings? Don't answer that. And yet I want you to answer that. Are you willing to do not the suffering part, but suffering is an an overflow of doing what he did as you serve others in love. That someday I would stand before him face to face and know that I've reached the prize in its ultimate form. Today, I just want to pray that you would know Christ, that I would know Christ, that I would change the ledger, that I would see what is important in this world and what is not, that I can answer the question, what is my hope? And I would say my hope is in Christ alone. Not my hope is in Christ and my hope is in Christ alone. Let's just pray together. I hope that the word has spoken to you today. And uh, if you want specific prayer about that, I'd love to speak more about that. If you have questions, especially if you're just new to this and you're going, I don't fully understand this. Well, none of us do. But we're just doing our best in the strength and wisdom that he gives us as we're filled by his spirit. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you just encourage us, just as Paul did from prison, to have that continued joy that we would never get tired of hearing the truth of your gospel, your good news, that faith in you alone brings the saving grace that we desire deeply, that you are our hope, you are our living hope, and that we can praise you every day of our lives. Put our our mind on the prize. Help us in times when we feel weak to stay strong. And fill us by your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.